Welcome to the Fair Housing Insiders. We are so thankful that you joined us. Uh, and please remember to subscribe here on our YouTube channel or follow and like us on your favorite social media outlet, which you can find links to in our show notes for even more fair housing news and insights. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fair Housing Insiders, another special episode that we're bringing to you today. HUD has come up with a lot of guidance. We've had a few special episodes, so we look forward to sharing this particular episode on the applicant screening process, their recent guidance on that topic. I'm your host, Jonathan Saar, and today we are joined with by uh, Leslie Tucker, and we look forward to your insights on this uh, topic. So. Leslie, it sounds like this guidance focuses a lot on criminal history screening. So a question, is this notice related to HUD's proposed regulations related to criminal screening? Uh, no, it does not. Although, as you say, it, it certainly does address criminal history screening. Um, but this guidance, which was issued in May of this year, 2024, is actually completely separate from those proposed regulations. Um, there are two major differences between these two uh, between these two uh, pieces of guidance or or regulations. One is that the proposed regulations, which we are currently waiting on final regulations on, it only applies to housing authorities and to HUD funded properties. This particular guidance that we're going to talk about today applies to any property that is covered by the Fair Housing Act, which is, you know, just about all rental properties. So that's one major difference. Uh, the second is this particular guidance that we're going to talk about today doesn't just focus on criminal history screening. It also focuses on credit and eviction screening as well. Okay. Well, I think that most of us understand how criminal history screening can disparately impact applicants of certain races and ethnicities, but how is HUD justifying placing limitations on credit and eviction screening? Great question. Um, and what the guidance tells us is that based on certain statistics, HUD has concluded that certain groups of applicants are more likely to have poor credit and evictions on their records. Uh, specifically, HUD has found that black and brown persons uh, people with disabilities and survivors of domestic violence are disproportionately more likely to have a low credit score than other demographic groups. Um, and we're looking at eviction records. HUD has found that black and Hispanic applicants, women, families with children and people with disabilities are evicted at disproportionately higher rates compared to those who are not members of these groups. Um, so this is how HUD is sort of reasoning that uh, things should be done a little bit differently with regards to your screening processes. Okay, appreciate the, the insight there. So is HUD telling housing providers that they should be making exceptions for applicants within these protected categories? No, it's not necessarily about making exceptions across the board, you know, for anyone that's in these protected categories. This guidance is primarily about what housing providers should be looking for and considering in the first place. Um, this notice is about 24 pages long. So it's very long, it's chock full of information, um, and there are a lot of key points um, so I'll just, I'll cover a few of them here today. <laughs> um, there's a lot of discussion in this guidance about the use of and the reliance on screening software when processing applications, uh, which is very, very common, as most of you know. 
HUD's concern is that many times these records that the software produce, um, they're inaccurate um, or they're incomplete. So blind reliance on these tools means that potentially many applicants will be denied who maybe shouldn't be. Um, so to avoid these kind of erroneous denials or outcomes, HUD has really stressed, not just in this guidance, but for the last several years, that all housing providers should have a process in place to allow applicants to dispute their record, uh, to provide any additional relevant information, mitigating circumstances, and, and things along those lines. Um, Another really important point that HUD makes in this guidance is related to the consideration of credit information that isn't really relevant to someone's tenancy. Um, and that includes someone's credit score. Um, you know, HUD really uh, discourages policies that require the use of someone's score in determining whether they are eligible or not. Um, so let me give you some examples of, of other things that they mentioned that could fall into this irrelevant category. Um, one example is if a tenant will be using a housing choice voucher, otherwise known as a Section 8 voucher, to pay their rent. Um, but they have a very low credit score, maybe um, you know multiple delinquencies reported on their credit report. So HUD argues in this notice that if an applicant's rent payment is being provided by another source, like this voucher, then their poor credit really isn't relevant, um, you know, to whether they should should be a tenant. Uh, because they are not going to be paying their own rent. Uh, another example given is if an applicant doesn't meet your minimum income requirements. I mean, a lot of properties have minimum income requirements in order to be eligible. Um, but if their rent is going to be paid maybe by a third party, by a family member, someone else, then the fact that they can't meet your minimum income requirements shouldn't be relevant. It should not be considered. Uh, and a third example is if an applicant has negative credit history due to uh, something that's probably never going to happen again um, or unlikely to happen again, like uh, a significant medical event, um, a family emergency, something like that that's in their past that uh, is no longer an existing circumstance probably shouldn't consider it uh, in, in, you know, whether they are eligible or not. Okay. If, if you don't mind, Leslie, just, if I can interject for a moment, isn't what HUD is describing essentially making exceptions for certain people? So couldn't that be risky from a fair housing standpoint? Well, that's a great point, Jonathan. And the answer in my opinion is yes. Uh, making exceptions for certain people that veer from your typical screening criteria is certainly risky because it takes away that level of objectivity. Um, that's why so many people, so many housing providers use screening companies and screening software in the first place, which is to kind of take those decisions out of their staff's hands and it ensures that all applicants are subject to the same criteria. Um, in fact, a lot of times, you know, your staff doesn't even know uh, someone's background, someone's race, uh, you know, what their circumstances are. It's completely out of their hands. And that process is set up to look like that intentionally. This guidance makes it clear that HUD isn't particularly concerned about those risks, unfortunately. Um, so it's crucial that if you decide to make an exception for someone who doesn't, for example, meet your income requirements um, or per perhaps your, your credit score requirements. Um, and let's be clear, HUD thinks it is absolutely okay for you to do that 
in certain circumstances to make those exceptions, you need to maintain very clear and thorough documentation of why you did make that decision. Got it. So what does the notice say then about eviction records? So a few things about evictions. HUD states that housing providers shouldn't be considering any eviction where the tenant actually prevailed or where the eviction was dropped. The mere fact that an eviction was filed against someone uh, sometime in the past shouldn't count against that applicant. Uh, because oftentimes evictions are filed, but you know they never follow through. The, the landlord maybe doesn't follow through on it. They drop it. They dismiss it. Sometimes the landlord or the uh, the landlord loses that case, but that may not be reflected in the records. HUD also emphasizes again that these records are not accurate um, in a lot of cases. So it's important to make sure to give applicants the opportunity to correct that information uh, if necessary. So are there any other key takeaways from this guidance that you can share with us? I mean, of course, we can talk about this all day if we'd like to. Um, but yeah, it's just a few other, uh, other things. Uh, the first is that HUD doesn't necessarily specify in this guidance exactly what your criteria has to be uh, when you are screening for people. But they do make it clear that housing providers cannot shield themselves from liability simply because they use you know, screening software or a third-party screening company. Uh, any owner or management company can be liable for a denial that's found to be discriminatory. Uh, you know, whether that's intentional or not intentional doesn't really matter, you know, even through the use of these automated products. Um, so that's one really big takeaway. Another is um, if your criteria only considers certain information or only looks back a certain number of years, uh, which is probably you know what it should do. There should be you know a limit on what you are considering. Certainly, you should not ask an applicant for any information that goes beyond that specific criteria in your application. Let me give you an example. If your screening software only looks for you know certain felony offenses, convictions, within the last five to seven years, so that's your look back period, your application should never ask an applicant, you know, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Um, and just to kind of see, you know, what the applicant may respond with, uh, mm -hmm. because that goes beyond what you're actually looking for. It's not ever, it's within the last five years or seven years or whatever your criteria actually is. Um, and the same would apply with eviction records as well. And the last point that I will make uh, regarding this guidance is that HUD places a lot of emphasis on transparency. Um, it stresses the importance of applicants having easy access to your tenancy criteria, your screening processes, uh, you know, how to submit evidence of mitigating circumstances in case of a denial, um, how to contest those records if they believe that there's something wrong with those reports, uh, and of course, how to submit a reasonable accommodation request. HUD loves it if all that information might be available on your website, uh, but at the very least, all of this information should be in writing uh, and should be made readily available for any potential applicants. That enables them to kind of make their own decision as to whether they, you know, whether they want to apply, whether they maybe should apply, um, and gives them all of the information up front. Got it. That's a lot. A lot of information. <laughs> so uh, going from 24 pages to just a few bullet points, but Thank you so much. Nice overview, a lot for our community to consider. And we're very grateful that we have this opportunity to share this with the community, with these, with HUD, 
uh, with the recent guidance. So thank you, Leslie, for bringing that to the table again uh, today. So we look forward to our next episode. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been a special episode focusing on HUD's new guidance. So thank you for tuning in. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we can't wait to hear your feedback about today's episode. Do you have a topic that you would like to see discussed in a future episode? Feel free to share that with us. In the show notes, you'll see a link to sign up for our newsletter. This newsletter will keep you up to date with our latest episodes, blogs, and information about our online fair housing courses. Thank you again, and happy training.